Excellent. Thank you. And already uh, seeing some sparks of collaboration, so that's always wonderful. Uh, with that, I'd love to bring up our next uh, panel and our moderator. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Goldie Bird, Executive Director for the Com Center for Outreach in Alzheimer's, Aging, and Community Health at North Carolina A&T State University. Dr. Bird is a fantastic partner to us against Alzheimer's, our African American uh, network. And then also, Dr. Bird is the project lead for our Alzheimer's and Dementia Disparities Engagement Network. So we're privileged to have Dr. Bird and an amazing panel to talk about how we can leverage patient-centered research to address health disparities. Good morning. This morning, this panel will explore how patient and community-engaged research can advance our understanding of brain health disparities. Uh, the panelists will highlight strategies for engaging patients and caregivers in research, in identifying community research priorities, and for developing community-anchored research partnerships to address brain health disparities uh, that impact communities of color. Uh, we are very excited this morning uh, to have such a, uh, an outstanding group of persons to share with us this morning. We have Joyce Balls Berry, and she's fondly called Joy, uh, who is an assistant professor of epidemiology and program manager for the Office of Community Engagement and Research for the Center for Clinical and Translational Science at the Mayo Clinic. We have Daisy, and just raise your hand when I introduce you. This is Joy on the end. Um, we have Daisy Duarte. Daisy is a clinical trial volunteer for the Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer's Network, which is Diane, the Diane study. We have Julie Kennedy Lesh. Julie uh, is an engagement officer for the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI. And then Jamie Perales um, is a postdoctoral fellow for the University of Kansas Alzheimer's Disease Center. Um, and he's representative of the Memory Strings Kansas City Alliance. We're going to begin this panel by asking each of you to share with us, just give us a little bit about yourselves and your work, and then we'll move into some questions. So just share with us your journey. I'm going to sit down so you can be the stars. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I want to say thank you again for the opportunity to, to share with you a little bit of the work that we're doing and the opportunity to address this wonderful audience and raise awareness about something that's actually very close to my heart. So I am a community-engaged scientist. I'm a psychiatric epidemiologist by training and a health educator, and my work really centers around looking at ways to increase health equity and reduce health disparities using community-engaged research models. So my colleagues usually call me the methods person in terms of how do we engage the communities as well as stakeholders in the research work that we're doing. Some of my work has centered on looking at willingness and readiness of, of minority communities to participate in research. I've done work in barbershops and churches and other things like that, as well as much, a lot of basic epidemiology work. And the reason this is really important to me is actually today is the one year anniversary of me losing my father to cancer. And a couple years prior to my dad's passing, his best friend passed from Alzheimer's complications. And um, as a family, um, his family, and I considered him an uncle, decided to donate his remains to research. And many times African Americans don't always talk about the importance of research after. And so I'm delighted that we are having a chance to really have this dialogue so we can talk about research prior. Thank you. I'm, uh, my name is Daisy. I'm a clinical trial participant and I'm also a caregiver to my mom for the last seven years. Thank you very much for, for having me. Um, my name is Chaim Perales, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow from the University of Kansas Alzheimer's Disease Center. Um, 
A bit of a reason why I'm here today is my research focus is I want to become an independent researcher in Alzheimer's disease disparities, especially among Latinos. Um, my research focus comes from two different experiences. First of all, my personal experiences and also the research um, experiences I've had along my life. Um, first of all, in 2009, I started working on an uh, international epidemiological project on aging, and that actually set the grounds for my interest in, interest in aging. Um, one year later, in 2010, my grandmother got, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and, uh, and uh, two years later, actually, her sister, as well, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And then I also have another relative who recently died of Alzheimer's disease. So it's, it's something that's really touched me very, very deep. Um, um, after that, I realized that I really wanted to narrow my focus on Alzheimer's disease research. And um, my first opportunity was at the University of Cambridge. I worked together with Professor Carl Brain in um, doing, uh, working on another epidemiological study on Alzheimer's disease, in particular the city of Cambridge, United Kingdom, and also conducting um, a literature review on uh, quality of life instruments for people with Alzheimer's disease. Quality of life uh, at the time was my focus, and I still, I, even though I'm doing something a little different now, I still think it's a very important thing. Um, some researchers might consider quality of life as a soft outcome, but if you ask caregivers and if you ask patients, I think it's one of the most important things. Um, then, uh, three years ago, I moved to the United States, um, and I started working at the KU Medical Center. At the time, it was my first uh, introduction to intervention research and um, adaptation of interventions to the Latino community and actually working with, with the community itself. Um, I think it's been very enriching. I did two different uh, jobs, really. Uh, one of them was a, maybe a little farther from Alzheimer's research. It was actually smoking cessation among Latinos, which if you see it in, in a way, if, you, if they quit smoking, that's a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So, in the distance, it really is related. And then um, the other one is the one that I'm most interested in is raising awareness uh, among Latinos. And so we developed a 45-minute presentation intervention um, to raise awareness among different layers of the Latino community, not just the lay community, but also the providers who are serving that Latino community. And uh, now we're actually using this intervention to recruit participants into a clinical cohort. Um, and this is a national, many people here probably know it, a national longitudinal study in which we try to better understand memory, thinking, um, and Alzheimer's disease among different people, in, my, in particular myself, among Latinos. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Kennedy Lesh, and I am from PCORI, or the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Uh, for those of you who don't know, PCORI uh, is an independent research organization that was authorized by Congress in 2010. Uh, we're overseen by a 21-member board that represents the entire healthcare community, so uh, includes clinicians, researchers, payers, uh, as well as patients and caregivers. And we fund comparative effectiveness research. Uh, that engages patients and other stakeholders throughout the research process. So when I say comparative effectiveness research, um, it really means exactly what it sounds like. It's uh, comparing two different approaches that we know are efficacious or we know they work in a controlled setting. So comparing, how, comparing them to each other to see how they work in the real world, uh, who they work for, um, and which is better for whom. Uh, so the governing philosophy of our work is patient and stakeholder input from the beginning to the end. Uh, so patients, caregivers, and other important healthcare stakeholders have an input into what we study, how we study it, how we measure it, how we communicate about the results of our work. Um, as an engagement officer, I work with the study teams on the ground to make sure that they have the tools that they need to authentically engage and partner with patients and other stakeholders in the planning stages of their projects and the conduct of, of the research and throughout the dissemination process. Um, there's really so much to learn about how to best engage with the end users 
uh, especially in the clinical research space. So at PCORI, we're really dedicated to advancing the science of engagement uh, and understanding how engagement can lead to better health outcomes, more useful outcomes for patients, stakeholders, and really the entire healthcare ecosystem. Thank you all so much. I'm going to ask you some questions and to get some dialogue going. I'm going to start with you, Daisy, as a caregiver and um, a person who's been involved in studies. Tell us your experience as a caregiver and, the, and what it means to you to be able to participate. To participate in clinical trials? Yes. I wouldn't change it for the world, to be honest with you, because I know I'm not standing there you know, just waiting for something to come. I'm taking a stance to the disease. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, well, what do you do? Tell us about what you do. The Your trial that I'm in. Mm -hmm. I get two. I get well. It used to be two shots in my in my stomach, mm -hmm. but now I just get one for five minutes, and it's uh, automatic. Uh, it's not by injection. It's an automatic pump that gives it to me mm -hmm. with the course of five minutes, and. Um, it's once a month, and then once a year I go to St. Louis and I do uh, cognitive testing. Mm -hmm. But it's a double-blind study, so you don't know if you're on the medication or not. Exactly. What would you like for researchers to know about engaging individuals of color, particularly in research studies or clinical trials? Well, there's got to be, I think that with clinical trials, they have to make it easier. Like, for, for instance, for me, they come out to me. I don't have to drive to St. Louis. Mm -hmm. they, they, a nurse drives out to my house and gives me my, my shots. Um, there's incentives. You know, they pay for the hotel when I go out in, in November. Mm -hmm. They'll pay for the hotel. They'll, they'll take care of me completely instead of me out-of-pocket expense. Mm -hmm. And you just have to, I guess, like, You've answered it. You're fine. I'll come back to you. You're doing great. Jamie, um, with, with your work, um, you're focused on engaging communities. Could you share with us just a little bit more about your intervention and, um, and tell us what you're learning? Absolutely. Um, well, we form part of uh, an alliance called the Memory Strength Tendency Alliance. As this is a collaboration between <clears throat> us, the Alzheimer's Disease Center, and also Latinos Against Alzheimer's, the GAP Foundation, and the different uh, entities at the community level. And so I think it's one of the best examples of our community work is we've, uh, we've done several things. The first thing is we created the Envejecimiento Digno, which is the 45-minute intervention to create Alzheimer's disease awareness that I was talking about before. It includes uh, talking about what are the signs or the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, uh, how it's diagnosed, um, the impact it has on Latinos, <clears throat> excuse me, and the importance of research and the fact that uh, the first person to be cured of Alzheimer's disease will be a research participant. And so um, our goal is to, is to get, educate people and then to get them into our clinical cohort, first of all. And so first we created that intervention and we pilot tested it. Um, then we refine it together with a lot of help from Latinos Against Alzheimer's, creating more materials and making it more um, less less research looking and more friendly to the to the participants. Let's say um, the next thing we did is we can we um, put, we brought together all the uh, the Latino um, let's see the leaders of the Latino community, including. Um, leaders on the media, Univision, or Tico Productions, so the radio, for example, um, clinic, uh, different member, um, community clinics, also uh, community centers, and we did this 45-minute uh, uh, intervention to raise awareness, first of all. We also brought Daisy Duarte, who was super helpful in, in bringing advocacy and getting people to understand what it really feels to be a caregiver of a person with Alzheimer's disease. Um, doing this, uh, this session, this, it was a, let's say, probably like two-hour session, we achieved, uh, um, we got to have 15 uh, people in our advisory board. We also um, get to have two um, community clinics that are uh, referring people to our 
to our studies. And uh, we also have two community centers in which we're actually going to um, be doing as part of their activities, that not just the recruitment, but also the, um, the assessments for the clinical cohort for this uh, study that we're working on. And uh, um, we also um, did a two-day um, training for promotores de salud, who are people that are providers, but at the same time, they're part of the community. And we did the same thing in Bejecimiento Digno. It's really helpful to increase uh, awareness among them. Um, we also brought you as well, I remember. And um, they actually, they actually, it actually had a very uh, good feedback. Uh, we also showed them around in, in the KU Alzheimer's Disease Center to show them that, to demystify research centers and to say, hey, we, we, are, we are good people, Basically, we, don't, we don't buy it. Um, um, we show them that our offices look like any other office and, and wherever people work. Um, our lab, our research lab, is, actually looks very much like a gym because we're specialists in exercise for Alzheimer's disease prevention. Um, and so, and yeah, we got very good feedback. And they actually, um, actually, we also taught them how to use the ADA, which is a screener for, um, for cognitive impairment that they can be start using from now at their centers. And then we also, or it was me in particular, uh, showed up uh, twice on the media, once at, uh, at uh, Univision in a three-minute sketch, and uh, another one on the radio. And all these efforts together have brought us uh, actually a lot of, well, not a lot of people, but they're starting to bring people. It's actually multiplied the number of people we have in our pipeline for a study up to 400%. Yeah. That's awesome. which, which in numbers might be smaller, yeah. but, it, but it's a lot compared yeah. to what we had before. That's awesome. Thank you. And Joy, could you talk to us about community collaborations and how that has impacted your research? Yes. So for over the last um, 20 years, I know I look like I'm 12, but for the last 20 years, um, my work has focused on uh, community engagement. Um, and thinking about different ways that we can actually work with different communities. So for instance, as an African American woman and a Christian, I know the power of the black church. And there is power in what comes from the pulpit. There is power in what is said by the deacon boards and things like that. So how do we engage church leaders in thinking about health? So some of the work that we've done in the past is really thinking about how can we impact church ministries and health ministries. The other thing that, um, that I've also found when I've worked with the Somali community, for instance, on some of our work, is working with the mosque. But then also thinking about the cultural awareness for me as a woman scientist of working with this community I need to make sure that someone vouches for me because I'm not from that community. So it's also thinking about ways to engage those stakeholders and the leaders, even the non-traditional leaders in the community who might not have a role in health or science on engaging them in a dialogue about the things that are important for them. So there's been times when, um, when our team has help groups write grants and things like that that have nothing to do with the science that we're doing, but they just need to keep their doors open. And so we've helped them keep their doors open. Um, and the other thing that I think has really been pivotal is making sure that we listen. I think a lot of times, you know, scientists, we have our benchmarks, and you're, you're a fellow now, Jamie, and I remember when I was a fellow, you know, there were certain benchmarks I had to reach in order to become a little more independent. <clears throat> And, you know, and you think about those things, you're like, okay, I've got to make sure that I get this paper submitted and I've got to present at these meetings. And that's fine for us as academics, but that doesn't mean anything to the groups that we're serving and the other end users of our science. So how do we go back and disseminate those findings? How do we make sure that what we're saying is not jargon and that it really is caring as well? Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank you. And Julie, finally, who can apply for a PCORI award? Um, are there any restrictions? And what should people do first if they're interested? Uh, so yeah, PCORI awards, there, there are uh, a group of awards that we call the Engagement Awards, which are uh, Research Support Awards. Uh, so these are uh, awards like the um, 
Us Against Alzheimer's as one of our engagement award recipients. And they're to build uh, communities who are ready to be involved in research. So to build capacity to be uh, research partners. Um, that uh, those awards are ongoing and um, you can go to our website and click on funding opportunities and there, I believe there every three months there's an LOI due and it's a, it's a rolling type of um, process. Uh, the larger research awards, um, those are also ongoing. There is a broad uh, category and then there is a uh, pragmatic clinical studies category, and then there are some targeted funding announcements within uh, certain disease areas. Uh, the broad funding category is for uh, studies that are proposed by investigators at uh, academic medical centers. But the difference uh, about PCORI is that we, within the research application uh, for those large research awards, we look for evidence of patient and stakeholder involvement in the design of the study from the actual research question. So are you looking at something that is filling an evidentiary need uh, for the people who are going to be using the information? So that's a, a huge part of our work and, and I think what makes us different as a funding organization. Absolutely. Thank you all very much. We're going to move in. I'm, I'm seeing Jason's sign back there. He thinks I can read it, but I really can't because I don't. <laughs> so we're going to move into a moderated dialogue for just a few minutes, and then we will open it up to the audience question and answer. So our first question is, is it up? So. I'll join you for this section. Okay, so this that would be great. This is actually an audience involvement opportunity, so we can go to the <clears throat> so you take out your phones. This is one of the times where uh, we welcome you to have your phones out, <laughs> unless you're taking notes with it, which I know many people do. Uh, we're going to ask a couple questions that relate to our panel, uh, and we invite you to respond via text uh, to the number 22333. You're going to text our hashtag, so good to know. Uh, USA 2 Summit 17 uh, does not have to be case sensitive. That's okay. Panelists, we'll, we'll get your feedback in another way. So I think that if we'll go, so if you all have the instructions, remember 2, 2, 3, 3, and you can just keep it up. Uh, you don't have to, to go out of it once you start this process. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Bird for the questions. Okay, thank you. So, that was going to come. When you, you, I'm not sure if you can see that in the back, but I will read it to you. So, what matters most? Question number one. What matters most? When you think of research, what one word comes to mind? When you think of research, what one word comes to mind? And just impact, cure, needles, <laughs> holistic, science, invasive, hope, money, <laughs> microscope, unbiased, cure, did I say cure, invasive, Patience, engagement, science. Complicated. Bad patience, one word, bad patience. <laughs> Impact. Okay, history, science, science history maybe. Fear. Someone said fear, jargon, confusing. This is very interesting. Someone said bad. Okay, we'll do a couple more and then we'll move to our next question. Curiosity. Mm 
medicine, advancement. So I think it's important for us to, to hear this because as researchers, sometimes we, we just think everybody thinks the way we think, you know, or as a clinician, um, a provider. But there are all kinds of responses to this question. And this is something we should be aware of as, as persons who are involved in research. Okay, so let's just go to the next question. Unless anyone had a concern or would like to say a, wor a word about this. Um, so question two. Why are you here today? Why are you here today? Select one of these statements with which you most identify today, A, B, C, or D. Can everyone see this, or do you need me to read it? Read it? Okay. A, concerned about memory issues but not diagnosed. B, diagnosed with MCI or Alzheimer's dementia. C, your care partner for someone with Alzheimer's or other dementias. D, a former caregiver turned advocate. Former caregiver turned advocate. And E, professional interest as critical health, economic, and social issue. It looks like most of us here today are, have a professional interest as critical health, economic, and social issue. 70% of us. Okay. Question, yes, comment. Is there one? I was just saying I'm concerned when you look at B that there is nobody listed there. I myself am a person diagnosed with Alzheimer's and I'm so glad that I was invited to come and participate because in reality people like me who are living with this disease are the experts and we're we in the past have been eliminated from participating in these kind of forums and I'm so glad to see that a lot of organizations are now finally recognizing the fact that we need to be part of a, and participate in, included in this um, forum. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. Very important. Is there anyone else with a comment or question about this one? Okay. Let's move to question three. So this one says, what matters most? What do you hope the first Alzheimer's disease modifying therapy will do? What do you hope? the first Alzheimer's disease modifying therapy will do. And A is help maintain my independence and license to drive a car. B, follow conversations, find the right words and recognize my family. C, find my way around my home and neighborhood. D, keep the disease from progressing further. And E, keep my symptoms and behaviors under control. So it looks like we are aware that if we can keep the disease from progressing further, some of these other things will mm -hmm. kind of work themselves out, right, in some cases. So it's 73% D, keep the disease from progressing further. Okay. Um, I wanted to make a, sorry, it's me. Oh, <laughs> uh, I wanted to make a point, so something I, talk, I talked about, quality of life, that that could have been an option as well, be, be happy even though you're developing Alzheimer's disease. Well, that would, I think that would be interesting for many people. 
So quality of life. Quality of life. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. Thank you for that. All right. We have time for just a few questions, Jason. Um, so we will take questions from the audience. Yes. Oh, you're. Does anyone have questions for the panel? The panelists. Daisy, you're so modest about your participation in clinical trial, and I know you said you do this for your family. Um, I think it's also important to note that you are such a strong caregiver for your mother as well. Mm -hmm. So I just would be remiss if we didn't take one more opportunity to recognize Daisy's contributions to this field. Absolutely. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Right here. You're on the line, Daisy. Um, I have a question for my good friend Daisy, who's a hero of mine, and I want to thank this woman for bringing that up. You know, as, and I have to read this, I hope that's okay, but um, as we all know that Alzheimer's doesn't respect any demographic or gender or religion, and uh, I so respect your devotion to your mother, and I know your fear uh, as the tumblers are in place potentially for your own disease. Uh, personally, I know the front line well, having been a caregiver for my mother and now on the stages of the disease myself. But, you know, Alzheimer's, what getting to the question is more than a research project. It requires faith to fight the fear while we await a cure. So, Daisy, you and I have talked about this. If, you, if you're okay with us, tell us how you fight the fears of this disease. Um, you know, it's like a perpetual nightmare with a boogeyman trying to overcome. How do you fight the fear in faith? To be honest, I stay, I stay very positive every day. I take care of my mom. I don't think about me having the genetic mutation. Um, the only time I think about it is when I'm going to get my monthly visits. And I don't think of it as a negative way. I think of it as I'm doing something positive. If it's not going to help me, it's going to help my nieces and nephew. There's a question in the back. Next door to Diane. <laughs> um, that's for those folks who are right next to us. So as researchers, what would you say, you mentioned that you know, they're very helpful in going out to you, providing resources, uh, giving you a hotel you know, to stay when you come into town. What else can we do to make things easier for you to getting the work out, word out? Uh, is it you know, uh, divulging our results in a much easier format? What else can we do to make this more impactful, not only the general public, but also to solicit participation for clinical trials? I know it's a lot. <laughs> um, I'll be honest, Di the Diane team has done such a good, a good job in being out there pushing it. Um, they're constantly, you know, sending me emails reminding, you know, get more people involved. Um, it starts with the person. Like if I'm in clinical trials, I, I'm always advocating. I'm always telling people not to join the Diane study, but any clinical trial. It could be an exercise one. You could join an exercise one and other family members could, you know, join other ones. I mean, as a researcher, I would say just push, you know, more, more advertisement, more pushing people, emails. Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever you need to do, I, I, I don't know the word. <laughs> I don't know what to say. That's okay. Joy, you and Jamie might, might contribute to that question as well. Answer that. Sure. Um, no, I was thinking, it, uh, actually, uh, I would ask you a question regarding that. Is there any financial... Uh, need that you have because I assume you're a caregiver <clears throat> you might probably have to devote a lot of the time to caregiving so it, does that leave you time to participate in research for example is there something I guess some sort of financial incentive that we can give or, or we could receive from some entity at the state level national level that would help as well to increase participation do you think that would be something I think that if there was an, a financial you know incentive that would help too but Mm -hmm. You know, if someone wants to do it, they're going to do it regardless. Like for okay. me, I would do it for free just because I don't want this disease taking over my family anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of times um, with research participation, and I've also participated in research as well, 
is the fact that many times those that participate want to see the cure. You know, they want to see their loved ones um, live longer. They want to make sure that there are opportunities for prevention. Some of the things that we do um, in our program, and I'm also a WashU alumni, and I'm from St. Louis, so, mm -hmm. you know, so that's a wonderful thing, um, is we use social media a lot. And so we try to make sure that we are engaging the communities where they are. So that means ba what they call basic schemed outreach, which sounds real fancy and all that other stuff. Basically what it means is you go outside the walls of where you work and you go where people hang out. You show up and you show up often. That means nights, weekends. I can remember very early in my career, there were times when I was out at two and three in the morning because I was doing HIV research early in my career and I was going to clubs, you know, and interviewing people when they were coming out of the dance clubs in San Francisco in my car. So if you can imagine, I couldn't always tell my parents that they were like, oh my God, you were out at three in the morning, where? <laughs> so, I mean, so I think that we have to get beyond the fact that I'm Dr. Such and Such because the community doesn't always care. So when I go out in the community, I dress like the community, I take my high heels off, I hang out. If they're sitting on the floor, I sit on the floor. If they're eating certain foods, if I, if it, if I can eat it, then I will. Um, and I invite many of my community partners to my events at my house and things like that because they become a part of your family. And I think that we have to remember that as well. Um, but social media has been really one of the the most pivotal things that we've been able to do because it gets beyond geographic restrictions. Another thing that Daisy shed light to is what they call snowball sampling. And basically what that means is it's another fancy term. It means the research participant telling other people that they care about to participate. So it's a snowball effect. So one person tell another and tell another about their wonderful experiences. But we also have to hear those things that might not go so well as also. So, yeah. Um, one of the other activities that we're conducting is we're partnering with uh, Latino senior centers. Uh, these are centers that have about 60, 60 elders who are Latinos. And so the first thing we want to build is awareness, as I said before. Um, some people don't even know what Alzheimer's disease is or they think it's just a normal part of aging, so what's the need in doing research? And so we will give them the Envejecimiento Digno presentation, 45 minutes, and then link it to um, our studies straight away as an activity within their center. All right, do we, one more question. I'm seeing two more questions. Okay. This question is to direct, direct directed to Dr. Bird, uh, there is great distrust within the community. How do you distinguish between research and medical care? Because there is a promise that you get the best care if you're in a clinical trial, but what happens when the trial is over? Oh, wow. Yeah. And if we can have, when you answer, well, you're okay, but when anyone else answers, if you can just have the mic closer to your to your face. Yes. Thank you. So the question is, what, what happens when the trial is over with, regard, with respect to getting medical care? Uh, one of the things that we found and um, with working with African Americans, Merrill, is that our participants want things other than, uh, in addition to participating in the study. So it's important for us to be able to be a resource when we can. And even after the study is over, after they've done their part in the study, we continue to be that resource. So they know they can always call the center and we can connect them to, um, to some resource that they need, whether that's um, a different kind of doctor. They may not even be in Alzheimer's. It may be in another comorbidity or another condition. So we continue to connect them to that. And I think that's part of the trust that we're talking about. That's part of their understanding that we're not just, just there for a single study or a single trial, that we remain, um, and even if we can't do it on a large scale, but we are still a resource for them and we can get them connected. And that sometimes takes, it, it takes time and money to do that, but I think it's important to make sure 
that if we are going to be in the community, that there has to be some reciprocity, and it has sometimes it has to it requires an ongoing presence or an ongoing responsibility with them. Um, just to add to um, what Goldie mentioned yep. is it's showing up. It's about being there and then also being very honest with your research partners and your stakeholders because you are building this family mm -hmm. outside of the lab. And so that means also thinking about their needs. That also means telling them what your needs are and being very honest about what those needs are. And then the fact that you want to sustain the work even beyond the money. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't take a lot of money. Sometimes it, it, it might mean making sure they're on your listserv and you're constantly connecting with them through a newsletter or through some other activity um, outside of the clinical trial or the study. And so sometimes it just means we, we need to be more creative in making sure we're keeping the connections for those who want to. Yes. And one, I don't, there's Dr. Satcher, Dr. Satcher. And then I don't know which one of you was first. Okay. okay. Uh, is this on? Yes. Yeah, I wanted to uh, respond to and sort of join in the question about the implications for patient care. Mm -hmm. um, we just had this uh, meeting here two weeks ago, the Congressional Black Caucus, mm -hmm. and one of the main topics of discussion was clinical trials, mm -hmm. and, I, and I gave the keynote address. And what I want to say is that uh, 20 years ago, almost to the month, President Clinton apologized for the Tuskegee study. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember what he said, because I had something to do with what he said. Uh, <laughs> but, but I think um, he, you know, he apologized sincerely on behalf of the American people. Mm -hmm. um, and he also said, now we need you to promise us something and that is that you will participate in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that's critical. I think what we haven't talked about, except I think there was some mention, uh, we have a healthcare system that leaves a lot of people out. Yes. And, and even a Congress that would leave more out, I mean, if they could get the legislation through. So we shouldn't forget that there's a relationship between the opportunities that people have to receive care in this country and their willingness to participate in clinical trials. Now, having said that, let me say, um, I think that there are some really good things that have happened in this country because of cl clinical trials. Mm -hmm. uh, sickle cell disease, you know, when I started out in my career and that was one of the areas of interest, uh, the life expectancy was that the patients would not live to be adults. Uh, and because of a nationwide study, really, of using penicillin prophylactis, we've changed that dramatically with sickle cell disease. So it's sort of like um, George was saying about uh, some of the other areas. So I think we ought to talk some more about that. Uh, just finished uh, a study that we started when I was director of the CDC, and that is treating American Indians aggressively with diabetes in order to reduce end-stage renal disease. Mm -hmm. And after all of these years, now we know that those, because of that intervention, American Indians have a rate of end-stage renal disease that's equal to the white population or even lower. Right. So all of this happened because of, of clinical research and clinical trials. So I think a lot of great things have happened, but we still have this problem, can people trust the healthcare system? Not whether or not a group of physicians are going to do what they did in Tuskegee, but do we care enough about them to provide care and to make sure that everybody has access to a provider? I just I had to say that. Because Thank I, you very much. We needed to hear it. And your question was next. Nice. I just uh, want to say that uh, I think it's great that we have these polls. And uh, I'm a person who's living with Alzheimer's, 
And uh, while I was an IT manager at one point in time, I can't even use this anymore. So I, I just want to point out that while everybody's contributing, I'm sure most of my counterparts who are here with dementia probably are not. So I would just like you folks to take that into consideration when you do these type polls. Uh, I was also looking at the questions there, and my wife was asking me, well, which one would you select? And I got to tell you, I had difficulty trying to even determine which ones I would select. Mm -hmm. She was going to do it for me. So I just want you to keep that in mind. Thank you so much. We certainly will. Thank you for that. And I believe one final question, briefly. Yes, yes. In the, you, in the purple. Yes. One final question. He's bringing, he's bringing. My name is Spencer, and I am from Washington University School of Medicine. And I wanted to speak to that piece in regards to getting out into the community and building that trust. That is a significant barrier that I have run into and that we continue to work on. One, our study at Washington University School of Medicine is longitudinal, mm -hmm. and it includes biomarkers such as MRI, PET, and the lumbar puncture. So trying to sell that to the community that is okay to trust us because of Tuskegee. So at all levels, I get that you're just selling me a piece of goods. Yeah. So how do we work on that trust? We continue to look at those organizations that are out there and be a part of it. For example, we've gone to NAACP meetings, we've gone to the Mound City Medical Bar, we've gone to the Mound City Lawyers Association and uh, the medical forums and the like. So that's building trust where we can the YMCA's various organizations and sororities and fraternities, if you will. So trust. Yeah. We're trying to build trust in the community and we're just not out there looking for you to give us something and we're not a part of the community. So I just Absolutely. wanted to mention that, mm -hmm. that it is a real factor. When you go out in the community, they don't trust you. And on one other piece real quick, with respect to our study, we have people on our African American Advisory Board who participate in our memory and aging project study. So when we do community events, and we thank you for being one of our speakers at the Norman R. Say Lecture, it's helpful to have people who are actually participating in our research study so they're more apt to trust the person who's participating, who looks like them, and not so much, I look like them, but I'm not going through all the rigors that they are. So that's another piece, trust, and then having some folk in the study actually talking to the groups Absolutely. we're trying to reach. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely, and thank you for that. And let's thank our panel. I think we're, okay. time is up. Let's thank our panel. Thank you. Thank you. I want to add one thing to that is that trust starts, should start as early as possible in the research process. And that really was the point of this panel is that the best way to build trust is by engaging the community in the development of your research question, your research plan. Uh, and there are tools available for you to do that, uh, one of which obviously is the work that PCORI is doing and the work that so many organizations are doing, including us against Alzheimer's. So we welcome your partnership in that effort. Uh, and you can reach out to myself or Stephanie to engage uh, in our uh, work uh, to engage patients in developing research questions around Alzheimer's and dementia. So Ian, I know you <laughs> have a question, but uh, if you can gather with our panelists afterwards, uh, well, thank you so much to our panel for the great discussion.